Welcome back to the Agentic Schools Manifesto. This is Chapter 5, a learning tree model for policy making. It will be helpful for policymakers to have a compelling image to assist them in understanding how educational priorities are changing under the influence of the newly developed theory of experience derived from self-determination theory. Consider the consequences of motivation in the development of walking and talking. Toddlers and preschoolers are well known for randomly endangering themselves by darting into the street or practicing the use of dirty words at just the wrong moment in front of your in-laws. It is often difficult, once a small child develops the desire to learn a skill, to prevent them from practicing it at any random moment they feel the urge. Experts and careful observers of children both realize that when appropriate motivation is in place, then engagement follows. And when there is sufficient intensity of engagement, then deep conceptual learning is a likely outcome. To be clear, I am not suggesting that learning to read or acquire any other academic skill is just as natural as learning to walk and talk. Reading is definitely not natural since humans have only had reading available in the evolutionary blink of an eye. But the role of motivation and engagement in the learning process is the same for both natural and unnatural skills. The most efficient and effective learning follows from high quality motivation, ardent engagement, and informative feedback. The cultivation of appropriate motivation for learning any given skill might give the learning process an appearance of naturalness, but that is only because perceptions of naturalness probably follow from a properly structured environment, aka hidden curriculum, in which motivation and engagement are successfully cultivated before the learner is induced to work on the potentially dull mechanical details. Definitions of education have traditionally tended to be about individual fulfillment or the perpetuation of society, or both. When we take on a holistic perspective, we widen our view to take more of the moral universe into consideration. I will elaborate on what I mean by the moral universe in chapter 6. The underlying metaphors for education have been dominated by delivery, but a competing growth image has made a pretty consistent but marginal showing over time. A combination of growth and mapping metaphors will better reflect the understandings of scientists and practitioners. Visualizing the concept as a learning tree will help reduce the dominance of the deficient delivery metaphor. In the growing mental maps metaphor for education, there is a slightly more complex process involved. Let's go through an example of an everyday literal map making process before we explore the metaphor. Pretend I am in an office in Portland, Oregon, and you mention that you want to get to Los Angeles, California, which are both on the west coast of the USA. I make two points on a piece of paper then label them Portland and Los Angeles. But having given you just those two pieces of information, it's totally useless. The two points can only become a map after I depict the relationships between the two points, such as indicating which way is north, and then adding a connection between the points, such as highways, trail systems, or transportation options like buses, trains, or airplanes. But even that is of limited use, because if you do not know how you relate to the places I've already drawn, then the information is still useless. If you believe that you're in downtown Portland when you are actually talking with me via Zoom from New York, New York, which is on the east coast of the USA, then you are likely to make significant navigational mistakes. You may get so lost that you never arrive in Los Angeles. And if you only have a boat to get around in, then providing you with a highway map will probably not be helpful. In order for the map to become useful, you have to know where you are and how your position relates to the points and lines on the map. If I do an adequate job of depicting the relationships between you and one, your current location, two, at least one of the transportation options you have available to you, and three, your destination, then you should be able to accomplish your goal of getting to Los Angeles. If I do not do an adequate job, then you might still 
get to Los Angeles, but only if you overcome the limitations of the flawed map I provided you with. Applying this to learning. Units of knowledge, skill, and or information are useless until, one, they are effectively related to each other, two, the depictive relations reflect modes of change that are actually available to the learner, and three, the learner can fit themselves into that particular picture of the world in a way that gets them where they want to be. Applying this to learning. Units of knowledge, skill, and or information are useless until, one, they are effectively related to each other, two, the depicted relations reflect modes of change that are actually available to the learner, and three, the learner can fit themselves into that particular picture of the world in a way that gets them where they want to be. Instead of a spatial change from the states of Oregon or New York to California, we are now talking about changing the learner's state of mind. The key quality of educated people is the ability to move from negative states of mind to neutral or positive states of mind, independent of the circumstances in which they find themselves situated. The autonomous end of the motivation spectrum is the end that most consistently leads to states of mind that are neutral to positive. Positive states of mind are objectively the most productive states to be in and provide the best quality of life as well. Moving from one state of mind to another is the most elementary lesson that can be taught. The most fundamental lesson of elementary school is governance of behavior our own and other people's. The primary topic that elementary education is properly concerned with is the human mind. Children need to learn to navigate the terrain of their own minds so they can effectively navigate the real world based on how it challenges their mind's ability to achieve its goals in practical terms, not in the abstract. Therefore, what is elementary in elementary school is gaining control over your own behavior, both mental and physical, and learning to coordinate your behavior with others. Learning to coordinate your behavior with others is governance. Literacy, numeracy, and all other academic subjects need to be seen as means to these ends, not as ends in themselves. The mastery of our own individual behavior requires us to realize that just because we think something, it doesn't make it so. Our minds, especially when we are children, are highly productive illusion machines. The task of becoming an adult involves mastering the process of disillusionment, the process of uncovering mistaken and or ineffective mental maps. By the time children are of school age, they have many ideas about themselves and the world based on a combination of the way their brains were built and how their experiences have shaped that building process. As Jonathan Haidt points out, based on the work of Gary Marcus, quote, the brain is like a book, the first draft of which is written by the genes during fetal development. No chapters are complete at birth, and some are just rough outlines waiting to be filled in during childhood. But not a single chapter be it on sexuality, language, food preferences, or morality, consists of blank pages upon which a society can inscribe any conceivable set of words." End quote. Young children live in a magical realm in which thinking makes things happen. The popular success of The Secret, a 90-minute exposition on the power of positive thinking, shows that magical thinking is not limited to children. Throughout our lives, we build up a vast repertoire of mostly unconscious concepts about both the world and our own minds. Unfortunately, many of those concepts are inappropriate for the complex globalized society we have today. They may have been perfectly adequate to the societies of our hunter-gatherer ancestors, but our society has become too complex to navigate with the relatively simple understandings that worked in the deep past. Illusions are a mismatch between the way the world is and a part of how we cognitively map that world. 
The reason we can discover our mapping errors is because we have multiple methods of mapping and various sources of information to feed into those methods. We do not simply make a map and then use it forever after. Except under the most stressful conditions, we constantly verify our maps non-consciously by cross-checking various sources of information. And even under the best of circumstances, some kinds of individual illusion are only susceptible to social disconfirmation, such as that provided in participation in science, jurisprudence, journalism, and academically respectable accounts of history. The key question is about what it is that needs to happen throughout the process of a person making the transition from being ignorant to being educated. Learning, obviously, has to play a role. But learning is always present. The problem is that we default to shallow learning and more effort is required to overcome the activation energy hill that leads to achieving the kind of deep learning that has become necessary in our global society. Shallow learning relies on using the existing conceptions of the self, the world, and the relationship between them without making any substantive changes. In the growing mental maps conception of deep learning, three broad steps are required, where the failure to complete any one of them constitutes a failure to learn deeply. 1. Activate maps. The learner must have a goal or aspiration that requires them to activate their mental maps of the phenomena in question. Note that facilitation by a teacher is a widely used method of inciting the activation of mental maps. 2. Engage ardently. The learner must engage so enthusiastically that they test the limits of their existing mental maps and discover that the maps are inadequate for achieving their goals. 3. Revise maps. The learner must revise their existing mental maps through a complex growth process that associates their goals with their strategies for pursuing them. Ideally, they revise their maps in the context of high quality feedback in order to efficiently improve their outcomes. Note that facilitation by a teacher is one of the most widely used methods of providing high quality feedback. The deep learning process described above does not depend on age. It is true throughout the lifespan. In shallow or fake learning, mental maps get activated, but the learner either achieves their goal or does not engage ardently enough to expose the flaws in their maps. In the fake learning scenario, the goal is the trivial attainment of the reward, e.g. test score, grade, etc., rather than attaining mastery of the subject matter. Thus, deep learning in reference to the attainment of rewards can be achieved, but that defeats the ultimate educative purpose of learning the subject so deeply that mastery of the reality that underlies the subject is attained. The second step, engage ardently, is regularly defeated in mainstream K-12 schooling for both teachers and students, as indicated by the epidemic of disengagement. The failure to engage in deep learning is a potential hazard in a society that is globalized, according to a variety of experts and social commentators. Many of the most important concepts upon which our current society is built come from scientific, technological, and other complex fields of human endeavor. Most of them have arrived at anti-intuitive understandings that require insights that can only be attained through deep learning. This creates a conundrum for policymaking. Policymakers must set policy for endeavors for which they do not have the time and or the inclination to learn deeply about. In the case of education, there is a clear case to be made for the contradiction between the scientific technical understanding of learning and the intuitive content delivery understanding. The common content delivery conception of learning can mislead policymaking, as it did in the case of the Reading First initiative within the federal No Child Left Behind legislation, the subject of Chapter 9 and Appendix 2. Beyond merely explaining how a particular combination of metaphors for learning can better explain the technical understanding, a guiding image that can displace the content delivery image 
may be crucial to helping policymakers overcome their conundrum. The Learning Tree, on page 31, is presented as a guide to help policymakers make better education policy. The Learning Tree is a simplified visual representation of how an individual draws sustenance from the now moment and through a complex internal process comes to understand and contribute to future moments with substantial inputs from the organizations and societies in which they are embedded. A more complete version of the Learning Tree, entitled Theory of Experience, the Holistic Psychology of Growing Mental Maps, is presented in Appendix 3. Learning requires a feedback loop, and that feedback loop needs to be one that is meaningful to all the humans who participate in it. The learning tree has eight roots in the now moment, called the soil of the situation. Those eight roots are the primary human needs for air, water, food, shelter, sleep-relatedness, autonomy, and competence. Primary means that those are needs that are not derived from any other needs. They have non-neutral effects on well-being, and they are universal across all cultures. The roots come together into the trunk of well-being. The trunk of well-being is where the need supports sucked into the roots go through a process that gives them our unique stamp of individuality. It is where attitudes are created. The aspects of individuality are driven by the energy of emotions through motivation processes, structured cognitively by our dual minds, conscious and unconscious, to produce engagement patterns. Behavioral and agentic engagement creates the branches of experience. The outer area of the branches is where the leaves, flowers, and fruits of outcomes occur in consciousness. The seed of a giant sequoia is almost microscopic, but it can grow to become one of the largest trees in the world, and over 95% of the material substance out of which it builds itself is drawn from thin air, not as many people suppose, the soil. Photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide from the air, uses energy from the sunlight to break off the carbon atom to build the tree, and then exhales that oxygen. So the question is, where in this model of learning does the majority of the substance and the input needed to integrate that substance into our individuality come from? First, the organizations and institutions to which we belong, such as schools and families, are the air that supplies the bulk. Second, the society, culture, and or our ancestry are the solar energy that enables us to combine the modicum of our individuality that we bring up from the soil of the situation with the substances provided by our group. That combination produces the leaves, flowers, and fruits of outcomes that also fall down to be mulched into our new nows. So far, the model covers growing, but what about maps? There are actually two kinds of maps in this model, one portrayed and the other only implied. The relationship between where the roots find need support and where a modicum of individuality contributes to the structure of a leaf, flower, or fruit forms the first map. In healthy circumstances, the roots should be roughly correlated to the leaves, flowers, and fruits. In unhealthy circumstances, they are not. If the shedding of outcomes into the new now does not form a properly self-reinforcing feedback loop, then learning is compromised. When our context feeds that modicum of individuality back to us from the situation, then we know that the mulch generated by our families, organizations, culture, society, and our ancestors will provide us with what we need to thrive. The second map in this model, but not shown in the illustration, is formed by the interactions of many tree canopies. The individual's conscious ideas, leaves, flowers, and fruits, about how to attain what they need in life are determined by the shape of their canopy and how that canopy interacts with the canopies of other individuals they encounter. What might be called the manifest world that we consciously experience on a moment-to-moment -moment and day-to-day -day basis is shaped by the outcomes we produce and how our conceptions of those outcomes are influenced by our context of organizations, institutions, society, culture, and our ancestors. 
the roots of the tree are primary human needs. Most people are familiar with the first five primary human needs for air, water, food, shelter, and sleep. The needs for autonomy, relatedness, and competence are equally essential, but less well known. The well-being of the individual will be reflected in the qualities of the trunk. The trunk of the tree consists of structures, processes, and patterns, plus the energy that flows through the system as a whole. Structures are the elements of the system that give it form, both literally and metaphorically. Structures may include personality, dispositions, grit, resilience, personal narratives, and other aspects of an individual. Individual processes include both conscious and non-conscious aspects of thinking. The pattern that we are most concerned with in education is the pattern of engagement, since that is the interface between the individual and his or her world. The furthest reaches of the branches of this tree are where the air of the organization and the sunlight of the society, culture, ancestors join with whatever the individual has brought up from the now moment via the roots. The relative contributions of the individual, the organization, and the society are worth noting. What makes up the majority of the structure of, say, an oak tree? An oak tree does not create holes by extracting soil from the ground. When growth occurs, the tree roots push up the soil rather than sucking the soil into the roots. Nor do the roots completely fill the space below ground. Roots absorb water and a minuscule amount of material nutrients. They do not suck up enough physical material from the soil to build most of what we observe as the structure of the tree. The vast majority of that physical substance that makes up every plant, not just oak trees or giant sequoias, is carbon that was removed from carbon dioxide molecules acquired out of thin air. Over 95% of the substance of every plant is carbon. A similarly large proportion of the substance that determines individual human behaviors is generated from the organizational context in which they are embedded. Despite contradicting strongly held intuitions in most people, this is consistent with the extensive social psychology literature on the role of situations in shaping human behavior. The leaves, flowers, and fruits that grow are the outcomes that result from the interactions between the individual and the sociocultural context in which they are embedded. The leaves, flowers, and fruits fall down to become a mulch that generates new nows. The mapping aspect of this model has to do with the feedback relationship between the spatial arrangements of the roots and branches. The arrangements of both the roots and branches are dynamic. The branches represent to some degree the conscious mind, while the trunk and the roots reflect entirely non-conscious processes. The conscious aspect of the branches enable them to change more quickly than the roots. The more that the leaves, flowers, and fruits fall down to deliver nutrients into the soil, and the more of the nutrients that are picked up by the roots, then the more that the individual is being nurtured by that situation. We are using the term nurturing in a technical sense here that refers to the meeting of primary human needs. In everyday reasoning about education, the learning tree image suggests that all the participants in an educational interaction are each bringing to bear their understanding. Everyone has roots and a trunk. If one of the participants is charged with facilitating the learning of another, e.g. a teacher charged with teaching students, then it is self-evident from the mapping aspect of the metaphor that the learner's goals, methods of pursuing their goals, and their relationship to the context of their learning situation are all crucial to success for both the learner and the facilitator. The learning facilitator has to develop an understanding of the learner in order to effectively help the learner get better at interacting with the reality in which they find themselves situated. From a societal perspective, an education system properly organized should ensure that citizens are capable of optimizing their own states of mind and should encourage them to persistently assist other citizens to optimize theirs as well. Defining education in terms of growing mental maps in learning trees that are embedded in a societal environment 
implies a process for optimizing states of mind. The goal is to enable an individual to perceive accurately, think clearly, and act effectively according to self-selected goals that are appropriate to their social context. And the self-selection of goals is not merely the result of the efforts of a single ego, but the result of the interactions among the minds of multiple members of a community. The goals of people who are well connected to many other people are likely to either reflect the concerns of the whole or else present the community with new concerns that they might be well advised to take into consideration. From a policy-making perspective, the learning tree model suggests certain priorities if the learning processes are not producing the desired results. The first priority when things are not going well is to provide more support for primary human needs. Thwarting primary human needs will lead to disengagement and dysfunctional behavior. Supporting them will lead to more engagement and subsequently better outcomes. This represents a change from the dominant set of priorities that are intended to correct systemic problems. The dominance of schemes for testing and standardization that can be uniformly imposed suggests that policy makers want more instructional bookkeeping to better account for and presumably attain more control over the content that gets delivered. There is no apparent concern for the possibility that the instructional bookkeeping could defeat the ultimate purpose of schooling, educating children. Whatever success has ever been achieved within content delivery regimes were in spite of that concept of teaching not because of it. To be clear, I have no problem with the units of content that teachers teach per se. Even in the growing mental maps model, units of content play a role. It's just that the role they play is not central. It is peripheral. Units of content are neutral, not active components, which I will explain in Chapter 7. They're only useful to the degree that they ultimately serve the goals of the learner and help the learner get from one state of mind to another. The units that a teacher might present will only be useful to the degree that they are fit into the web of relationships among other units within the student's experiences of life, including the goals that the student considers important. In the individualistic culture in which I live, this is easy to comprehend. However, from a collectivist perspective, this formulation might sound naive. There is an important role for the group to play in this process. That role is played out through the shaping of the situation by policies and practices that transcend any particular learner. The fact that we refer primarily to the individual does not reflect the lack of respect for the role of the group. The model is visualized in a way that emphasizes the individual due to the psychological basis of the model. Inherent to the understanding of the model are the relative roles of the individual, the organization, and the society, as explained earlier. For five years, I was a volunteer instructor of first aid and CPR for the Red Cross. CPR stands for cardiopulmonary resuscitation. If a person suddenly stops breathing and their heart stops beating, CPR is performed to save their life. One of the lessons I taught was about the ABCs. In the context of CPR, ABC refers to airway, breathing, and circulation. The idea is that you have to deal with those things in that order. If a person's heart has stopped and she or he is not able to breathe through an open airway, then there's no point in manually circulating their blood by doing chest compressions. Circulating blood that does not have any oxygen in it is useless. This is an order of operations problem. If you fail to do the operations in the proper order, then you will not get the results you want. That is what is happening in most of our schools. They are failing at the order of operations. The learning tree model gives us the correct order of operations for education. The first thing to check out when you find a problem with learning is support for primary human needs. Using the tree model as a method of analysis, 
we can see that the lawmakers behind Reading First, the topic of Chapter 9 and Appendix 2, were trying to make a leaf grow without first making sure the roots of the tree were healthy. Reading first failed at least partly because the delivery model that guided the policy didn't include motivation as a key component of well-being and learning, let alone place well-being in an order of operations for learning to read. The current iteration of the science of reading is also going to fail as long as it remains true to the exclusion-delusion version of the delivery model. The exclusion-delusion is the topic of Chapter 8. If the current science of reading folks who have inherited the legacy of reading first attend to the roots of primary human needs first, and then focus on reading second, they will get better results than the original reading first folks got. When the proper foundation for education is in place, then science-informed investments in targeted areas will pay off. The science of reading will work if all the roots of the learning tree are nourished instead of ignoring them by focusing on one leaf decoding skills. Of course, if policymakers really pay attention to the learning tree, they will also see that reading is a lot more than just decoding text. In fact, all of the knowledge, skills, and information content that the mainstream system attempts to deliver are actually the means to achieve more important goals. They are not ends in themselves. All that content occurs in the leaves, not in the roots. The true goal that policy makers should be pursuing is primary needs satisfaction within cultural constraints. Each individual human is unconsciously looking for effective means to pursue goals rooted in primary needs. These goals can only be fully realized by the individual within the culturally relevant affordances provided by the organizations and institutions in which they are embedded. Educators will serve their students best when they participate in a systematic effort to make it clear to children that their unique goals are important so long as they pursue them within the constraints of the organizational, cultural, and societal context that we share. To be clear, their uniqueness is just as important as the cultural constraints. How they inform each other is where goodness, truth, beauty, and joy reside. And that is what education should ultimately aim for. Goodness, truth, beauty, and joy. If you gave me the $6 billion that was devoted to reading first, I would invest it in building the nurturing capacity of K-12 schools, where nurturing consists of support for primary human needs. The content delivery concept of education has produced situations that may be causing more harm than good for many children in our society. It provides an image that obscures the reality of learning rather than helpfully illuminating it. It produces a hidden curriculum that is toxic. The pernicious effects of the concept may not have been significant in the historical past before mass bureaucratic systems of schooling were developed. But now that we have such complex systems, the harms have become a $7 trillion annual cost to society, according to Gallup's estimate. The need for changes in the school system has been accepted across the political spectrum for over a century. But the efforts to make change have not alleviated any of the major symptoms that cause educational toxicity. Given that the policy making process is a human one, not a naively rational one, it is not surprising to discover that the intuitively obvious concept of education as delivery has been operating behind the scenes to shape how those change efforts proceeded. In Chapter 9, the limitations of rationality as part of the policy-making process is discussed. Unfortunately, conceiving of teaching as a form of delivery misled us into patterns of legislative management that have been making the situation worse, not better. It is only by using an updated conception of education itself that we can hope to do a better job of governing our education system. Until policy makers use a model that takes into account a more scientifically accurate conception of learning and how that process is shaped by organizational and societal forces, can we hope to make productive policy changes. 
The learning tree, shown on page 31 and with more detail on page 83, provides a visual guide to the growing mental maps conception of the learning portion of the educational process and the necessary priorities that follow from it. The priorities that follow from this conception will empower schools to become more reliable sources of goodness, truth, beauty, and joy. Students in schools like that will be more likely to think critically to problem solve and make decisions, demonstrate character, e.g. honesty, kindness, integrity, and responsibility, and prove that they understand science, social studies, and other important subjects. The organization of the learning tree makes it clear that support for primary human needs is a crucial foundation for the deep learning that is required for success in society today and into the future. This concludes the fifth episode of the Agentic Schools Manifesto. If you would like to gain access to the illustrations, the footnotes, the appendices, and the bibliography, the PDF and illustrated video versions of the book are available as membership benefits when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more at dladvocates.org forward slash donate. If you would like more information about the catalytic pedagogy philosophy, how self-determination theory applies in education, and what it would take to transform education systems around the globe, check out my other website, holisticequity.org. There, under the Tools tab, you will find a variety of valuable ways to either deepen your understanding or apply that understanding in your school. Thank you for your kind attention. <laughs>